This is part one of three about chapter two called The Chemical Basis of Life, part one. In this chapter, we're going to talk about chemistry and biology is just applied chemistry. And you're probably wondering why do we have to talk about chemistry in order to understand how cells work, you need to understand the level below cells, which includes molecules and atoms, and that's chemistry. Just to kind of show you, in chapter one, we talked about the 10 levels of organization up here, so hopefully this looks a little bit familiar. If you look at the top of this diagram, we have atoms, and then those atoms come together to form molecules and macromolecules. Then from those macromolecules you get cells, which remember are the smallest, most basic unit of life. So in order to understand cells and life, we need to backtrack a little bit, and we need to understand molecules and atoms. So this chapter is all about looking at atoms and how these atoms come together to make molecules. All right, so I kind of mentioned this already, but biology is founded on the principles of chemistry. So again, we need to look at chemistry in order to understand biology. Specifically, this chapter is looking at something called inorganic chemistry. And this is what you learn about in Chem 1 and Chem 2. Um, so this lecture is just a very condensed, very um, short introduction to inorganic chemistry. So inorganic chemistry is just looking at the nature of atoms, the nature of molecules, and these atoms and molecules do not contain carbon rings or chains. So molecules that contain carbon, we're going to look at those in chapter 3, and that's called organic chemistry. So we're going to start off with looking at atoms. And specifically, we'll start off with something called matter. Matter is just basically anything that contains mass and occupies space. So you, for example, you have mass, you occupy space, so you're made up of matter. Just like the tables, the chairs, your notebook, your computer, it's made up of matter. This matter is made up of the atoms that we're going to be looking at. So atoms, their definition, they're just the smallest functional unit of matter. And these atoms, they form all of our chemical substances. So everything on Earth, even in space, is made up of atoms. Specific types of atoms are called elements. And you'll find these elements on the periodic table, which we'll look at in a little bit. So examples of elements include nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, um, phosphorus, sulfur. So there's lots of different elements that we're going to be looking at. Then atoms of these different elements are going to come together to form molecules. So when you have two or more atoms, it can be atoms of the same element, so like two oxygen atoms, or you can have atoms from different elements, so for example, one oxygen and two hydrogens. When those atoms come together, when they bond together, they make up molecules. So we'll look at the structure of an atom. So here we have a really simplified atom model. So scientists, they initially visualized atoms as kind of these mini solar systems, which you see on the slide right here. In the middle of the solar system, you have a nucleus. So if you look in the middle of, you have a hydrogen atom on the left and a helium atom on the right. So again, in the middle, you have the nucleus. It's just the middle region. In that nucleus, you're going to find neutrons, which are the small white circles. 
These neutrons have a neutral charge to them. You'll also found, find the red circles with the little pluses in them, those are protons. So these protons, they have a positive charge to them. Then outside of your little mini solar system, you're gonna have electrons floating around in a circle. So if you look, these electrons are found on the dotted line and they have a little negative sign next to them. So electrons, they're found in orbitals and they have a negative charge to them. So atoms, they get progressively more electrons. So if you have more than two electrons, so if you have, for example, like six electrons like carbon does, you're gonna have more what are called electron shells. And these electron shells are gonna contain orbitals in them, we'll get to those later. But in the first shell, the shell that's closest to the nucleus, the middle of your atom, that first shell can hold up to two electrons. If your atom has more than two electrons, so it has three, four, five, six electrons, any electrons after those first two are gonna go into the second shell. And your second shell can hold up to eight electrons in that shell. And then eventually if you fill up the second shell, you'll get into the third shell, the fourth shell, the fifth shell, and so on. Just to kind of remind you about um, this structure of an atom, we're going to look at nitrogen as another example. So nitrogen, it has seven neutrons and seven protons in the middle in the nucleus. You can see that the white and the red circles. And then in addition to the seven neutrons and seven protons, you're going to have seven electrons. So your first two electrons, they go into the first shell. And here I highlighted the first shell. So those are the first two electrons. The next five electrons go into the second shell. And I circled those in red up here. So that gives you... So in our atoms, I talked about protons. Again, protons are found in the nucleus of your atom in the middle. And the number of protons, that's what's going to distinguish one element from another element. So in fact, this is so important. The number of protons is so important. They call it the atomic number. So your atomic number, it's your number of protons you're going to find in that atom of that specific element. Your atomic number, it specifically refers to number of protons, but it can also tell you the number of electrons in that atom. And this only works if your atom has a charge of zero. So if you have two protons, so two positive, plus two electrons, two negative. So positive two plus a negative two, that gives you a charge of zero right here. So be really careful when you're looking at your atoms. If it has a charge of zero, the number of protons matches the number of electrons in that atom. As I mentioned earlier, all the different elements are organized on a periodic table. Specifically, they're organized by that atomic number, that number of protons that we just looked at. And just to kind of familiarize yourself with the periodic table, um, the periodic table has columns and it also has rows. So if we look at the rows first, rows go from left to right. So if you look at the very top left hand of the periodic table, you see hydrogen up at the top. So hydrogen is in the first row. If you go over 
one row, you see that next to hydrogen there's nothing, but if you go down you have beryllium and magnesium down there. And these rows keep on going, there's eight of them, all the way over to where it says helium, and then you have neon and argon in the final row. So these rows, they actually tell you how many valence electrons that element has. So in your first row, if you look at hydrogen, it has one electron in its outer shell right here. So it's in the first row. Lithium also has one electron in its outer shell. So it has one valence electron. If you jump over to the next row where it says beryllium, magnesium, those elements have two electrons in their outer shell. So they have two valence electrons. And you can see that as you move to the right, boron has three, carbon has four, nitrogen five, oxygen has six valence electrons, fluorine has seven, and neon it has eight over here. So the neon, it has completed its outer electron shell. It has the full eight in it right there. So that's what the rows, kind of information you can get from the different rows. The columns go from top to bottom. So hydrogen and helium are in the first column, and that means they have one shell to them. They just have that one red shell. If you go down a column, starting with lithium, you see it has a red shell, that first shell, and a blue shell, the second electron shell. In fact, all of the elements in that second column, they only have two shells. You see the red and the blue. So for example, if you look at oxygen, it has a red electron shell and a blue. So it just has two. And then our third column, you have the red, the blue, and the yellow. So you actually have three electron shells. And you can see kind of this pattern in this periodic table. So in addition to the atomic number that we use to organize this periodic table, elements also have atomic mass. So the atomic mass is just the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. And we do this because protons and neutrons, they have about the same mass and then they're a lot bigger, so they're about 1,800 times bigger than an electron. So electrons, we just kind of say that they have a mass of zero. We kind of just ignore them. So we just look at our atomic mass as the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So for example, um, if we look at carbon, the most common form of carbon, carbon has six protons, it has six neutrons, so it has atomic number of six, because it has six protons. And the atomic mass is going to be 12. So you take your six protons plus your six neutrons, and that gives you 12. Some forms of an element can actually be heavier than the um, common form. And these are called isotopes. So you can have multiple forms of an element, and basically they just differ in their number of neutrons that they have. So they have the same number of protons, they're the same element, because that's how we define what an element is. It's identified by the number of protons, or that atomic number. However, some atoms of a certain element, they can actually weigh more and to get this, to get this higher atomic mass, that atom can just have more neutrons in it. So if you look at the example here, so we have carbon, usually it's in its C12 form. So usually carbon atoms have a mass of 12. And again, that means it has six protons and six neutrons in it. But every once in a while we have carbon 14, so C14. It still has six protons because it's still a carbon atom, but it's heavier. 
So in order to get a mass of 14, you just add two more neutrons, you have an eight neutrons. So carbon-12 and carbon-14, they're just isotopes of each other. They're different forms. So carbon-14 just weighs a little bit more than carbon-12. Some of these isotopes, we call them radioisotopes. So that just means that they're unstable isotopes. So they weigh a little bit more. They can actually emit subatomic particles or they emit radiation. And these radioisotopes, they can cause damage to cells, but we can also use that in healthcare. Um, so we can use radioisotopes to help treat cancer patients because those isotopes are going to emit radiation, they're going to kill those cancer cells. So these isotopes can be really, really useful in the meta field. In biology, we have some elements that are going to show up over and over and over. And the four elements are listed at the top. So we have hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen. So we're going to see these four elements come together. They're going to bond together in a bunch of different ways, make up a bunch of different molecules that we're then going to eventually use to create our cells. So these four elements, they typically make up about 95% of the atoms that we find in living organisms. Other elements, so that other 5% are going to be mineral elements or even trace elements. So these elements, they just make up a tiny bit of cells, but a lot of them are actually essential for normal growth and function. So these are like the minerals you get from your food um, or plants get these minerals from the soil. So just because you don't have a lot of the mineral elements or trace elements doesn't mean they're not important in the living organism. This slide is just showing the um, elements and their percentages in a human being. So if you look at the pie chart, oxygen makes up about 65% of our body. Carbon makes up about 18%, hydrogen is 10%. The oxygen and hydrogen, we usually find it in the form of water, so H2O. Carbon makes up carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids that we're gonna look at in chapter three. And then in addition to oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, you see nitrogen, calcium, phosphorus, sulfur, and then all those other trace elements in our body. So this first part of chapter two, we looked at atoms. And remember atoms have protons, which have a positive charge found in the nucleus. They have electrons, which have a negative charge, and those are found in those electron um, shells. And then you also have the neutrons, which have a neutral charge. These atoms, we have specific types of atoms called elements, and those elements are organized on the periodic table. And then finally we looked at those different elements that are really important for life. So that includes oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen that we looked